welcome to the National Family Support Technical Assistance Center's Office Hours. This is a running series. Today's topic is cultural mindfulness for family-run organizations. And I'm Gail Cormier, the Project Director of NASTAC, the Family Center of Excellence. We are led by the National Federation of Families. The monthly office hours series is designed with the family workforce in mind. This series is targeted for family-run executive directors and emerging and current family leaders. NASPAC wishes to support all the family support workforce. In order to accomplish this, we'll be hosting additional sets of series for other family support workforce staff as we continue along. Before we start our interactive conversation today, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's conversation is being recorded. The recording and any additional resources will be uploaded to our NASTAC website under the events tab. If you have any technical difficulties, please type your comment and someone will be able to assist you. Please also type your questions for the presenter in the chat box. We'll be watching the chat during the entire presentation. And I hope you get your questions ready because we want, we're here with experts and we want to answer them. Speaking of experts, unfortunately, Paul Canales, the executive director of Alaska's Family Run will not be able to be with us today, but we still hope to have a vibrant convers conversation. Our goal for office hours is to encourage this conversation between our guest presented today and all those in attendance. We encourage you to ask questions that will assist you in your daily work. We will unmute participants after the presentation portion is complete. If you can use the raise your hand button, that would be helpful. NASTAC hopes you leave this event invigorated and with new ideas to help you do your work. We ask that you you take time to complete a short feedback survey using the link provided at the end of this presentation. This survey will help us continuously improve our events and it also helps us fulfill our SAMHSA funding obligation to provide them with important data required by our contract. Please note, all information will be confidential and will respect your privacy we do not offer CEU credits for our events, but you will receive a certificate of, of attendance after the survey is complete. I would like to thank SAMHSA for allowing us to share this information with you today. And thank you all for joining us. At this time, I would like to introduce NASTAC's project manager for this series, Dana Aspey. Dana will also be introducing our guest speaker today. Dana? Thank you so much, Gail, and thank you everyone for being here with us. As Gail said, this is an interactive session. After our presenter does her pre brief presentation and answers a few questions, we wanna hear from you. Whenever you are sharing in the chat or when you unmute yourself, please make sure that you're using family-centered language that's trauma responsive, strengths-based when possible, avoids blaming caregivers, is inclusive of all cultures, person first, respectful, non-judgmental, and we wanna make sure that the language we use is consistent with our actions. Just to give you a little bit of background about this series, this is the fourth of eight sessions, and the series comes together to really support organizational well-being and leader success through mentorship. You can find the recordings of the first four sessions on the NAFSTAC events page. The goals of this series are to support executive directors and emerging leaders and family-run organizations through peer support. We also wanna make sure that we're increasing the knowledge of leadership management and mentorship skills. And we wanna provide a roadmap towards organizational well-being to enhance staff satisfaction, family engagement, and organizational sustainability. The way that we'll do that is to introduce new skills, strategies, and tools from subject matter experts like Miriam Monsalve Serna today. Um, we'll also be giving you tips for mentorship between established and emerging leaders, and those one-on-one -on -one sessions happen between each office hour. So if you don't already have a mentor or mentee, make sure that you head to the NAFSTAC website and fill out a TA request so that we can get you set up with one. During each at office hour, we have peer discussions about our experiences, what's working, and the challenges that we're experiencing on that topic. 
Finally, we leave you each month with a workbook that includes an action plan to implement small steps that all together will enhance your organizational well being by the end of this series. So let's start out by hearing from you. We're going to ask you to go to www.menti.com and type in the code 1620 4082. And one of my colleagues will be putting that in the chat as well. And I would love for you to answer what comes to mind when you hear cultural mindfulness. This is going to make a word cloud. So if you could try to find one word, that would be great, or a small phrase. What comes to mind when you hear cultural mindfulness? It's saying it can't be found. All right, let's do a little troubleshooting for that. One second. You might need a new number. Let's see. All right, 1620, 4182. Let's see if that one works for us. 1620. It's working. Oh, excellent. Great. Let me share that screen again. So type in one word. What comes to mind when you hear cultural mindfulness? Background and lives, mindful of others, cultures and histories. Respect, diversity, awareness. Multiple people putting in respect and diversity. So those words are getting bigger. Inclusivity, cultural sensitivity. Listening, acceptance, cultural competence. Very great. So we'll share the completed word cloud with you when we send out these slides. Consideration, mindful of others, great. Excellent. You can keep putting some things on there. But I'm going to go ahead and start to introduce um, or turn it back to Gail to talk a little bit about what cultural mindfulness looks like at a family run organization. And as you may know, Paul can't be here, as I said, and he was the executive director of the Alaska family run organization. But for 14 years, Ending in 2020, I was the executive director for North Carolina's state family run organization. So I know a little bit about cultural mind mindfulness at a family run organization. And what I found as a former and when I was an executive director, that really, really played to how the executive director really goes about their business and how they work within their staff, within their community, within their board, and actually at the state level. The ED has to be very flexible and always keep in mind how to really embed cultural mindfulness totally within the organization and within the image of the organization. So I saw some great um, answers here when we did the men of evil. You know, we heard, I, I heard, I saw listening. How does listening work within all the levels? Well, 
as an ED and as a leader in an organization, you would want your staff to really practice listening with the families they support as family peer specialists. But you also, as a supervisor, you need to listen to your staff and hear them and not always be ready for the answer before they finish speaking. To really sit there and take a breath and hear what your staff is saying and really be respectful of their culture and why they are speaking in a way. For instance, I know, and I, I'd love to see in the chat if anyone else has ever done this. I know that some people, when they're speaking, they have to start from the very beginning of a story and then build up and tell the whole story. And that's their culture. And that's the way they present a problem or a situation. As a supervisor, sometimes I would be saying in my head, instead of listening to the entire story and respecting someone, I'd say, okay, hurry up, hurry up, get to the point. You know, and I'm not really hearing them. And that's not very respectful of myself. So we have to learn that. And again, as we move up the chain, we have to listen to our community. You know, we're a family run organization and we may not have all the answers. Sometimes the community has that lived experience too that they can talk about and give back what they need from a family run organization. How do you work with that family organization in that community? You know, what's the community telling you? What do they need? And then, of course, as we move up the chain, the board of directors, you need to hear your board and you need to respect their culture and their diversity and all the points of view. You may be the executive director and you may have a certain vision, but your boss, the board is your boss. And they may all be coming to, together as a group to kind of express their visions. And they all might be very, very, um, there were maybe differences in their vision. And you as an executive director have to put it together, really listen carefully for what they're saying and understand how to move your business forward. So there's all different balancing effects that we as executive directors have to manage. And of course, our funders and the state and federal funding organizations in, in child and family mental health, they too want to express their visions and their their way of going about, their manner of going about business. And of course, as an executive director, you have to hear that and you have to be respectful. Any thoughts about that? You can put it in the comments. But we can move on to Miriam. Great. Before we move on to Miriam, we're going to do one more Mentimeter. This one is a poll. Um, so head back to menti.com and this time you're going to click the same code or you might have it still pulled up 1620-4182 and let us know what your organization has offered training on. Have you had training on cultural responsiveness? cultural competency, cultural humility, cultural mindfulness, something else related to culture, diversity, equity, inclusion, or none of these things. Um, and you can click more than one um, because we know that organizations sometimes offer trainings on multiple topics related to culture, equity, diversity, if you did click something else, we'd love to hear what it was your organization offered training on in the chat. So it looks like we've got the majority that are have had training on cultural responsiveness, cultural competence, cultural humility. A few people have had training on cultural mindfulness. Um, very curious about what else folks have had Some training on. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking our poll. We'll leave that up for just a couple more minutes or a couple more seconds. Tabby in the chat says that they did the ERACE program locally, working towards becoming anti-racist as an organization. Great. 
Wonderful. Looks like cultural competence is the most popular one so far. Great. Oh, thank you for sharing that link, Tabby. All right. Well, you can keep answering again. We'll share the results of this poll in our follow up slideshow that you will get. And now I would love to introduce our speaker, Miriam Monsalve Serna. Um, she is the founder and president of Center for Community Learning, Inc., where she provides leadership in planning, implementation, and evaluation of grants and contracts. She also provides ongoing technical support to local and national organizations and serves as a consultant in the field of cultural and linguistic competence and related fields. She co-leads the Technical Assistance Network for Children's Behavioral Health with the University of South Florida and Ch Children and Family Services. And she also makes sure that the values and principles of the system of care are implemented within a framework of cultural and linguistic competence under one community partnerships. And that's just one of many roles that Miriam has. I, very, I encourage you to read her full bio on her website. And at this point, I will turn it over to Miriam. Thank you. Thank you, Gay. Okay, so uh, and Miriam Monsalve Serna, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I came, I am originally from um, Colombia and I came here in 1980 as a grown up. And so I have two kids that uh, were born in Colombia that they were uh, eight and five when we moved. So they grow here. So they are truly a, uh, uh, truly what we call in Colombia Americans. All of us, we are Americans, but that's the way that we call it. So that's a little bit. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I have all my time work with Natura Helpers, community health workers, and from uh, training community health workers, we saw that the peers and the community health workers are really the anchor for cultural issues. So this is why I got engaged with SAMHSA and doing all those trainings and cultural competency. And as a matter of fact, I think that we have more people mentioning cultural competency because SAMHSA use the term cultural competency. Now some people saying that you are not competent that you have uh, the cultural humility is very is uh, is more or less what um, we should is our goal, but that's a uh, discussions of names. So it's very interesting when we have the name cultural mindfulness because less people have been trained specifically in cultural mindful. So it's a, a slide, the next slide. So as a reminder, culture, um, when we talk about cultures, cultures is an, an, a group of ideas, customs, and social behaviors that people have. So that's what we call that's what we call a culture in general. And culture uh, in an organizational setting is more like the social, the written and unwritten values, the philosophies and the practices. So that's more or less like a general idea what is culture in general. So next, when we want to put together Next, yeah, cultural mindfulness. So we have two terms that we have to mix. So mindfulness is really more than listening. Listening is the beginning of mindfulness. It's being at the moment, be living this moment that I'm talking, like the only moment at this time at 322. That's cultural mindful, paying attention, Miriam, the way that Miriam talks, the way that Miriam, uh, that you hear Miriam, the way that she uh, moves her hands. So that's what is called 
living this moment of this training and uh, being in this moment and be fully present. So that's fully present because sometimes I can hear, I am hearing, but I can I say, oh, he, there is somebody talking about recession. So that's not fully present. That's present in two. And that's okay because it's very difficult to be fully present uh, all the time that you are uh, alive, uh, that you are working with somebody else. Okay, next slide. So when you are fully present, really is like a bubble of you and the other or you and the others. Like here is for me, we are virtually, but it's you through the image that I have of all of you. So it's a construct that we have that is our own and the others, yeah? And we have to pay attention because in that construct, okay, because it's the whole others and, and our whole own. We have garbage in, garbage out. We have things that could be very explosive that comes to us. And there, there are topics that sometimes uh, could be a little risky to take into consideration. Next slide, please. So when you have two people, uh, uh, we need to uh, we need to be careful and seeing that we are two people in the interaction could be three people or different people. So and I have to be there without all that garbage, all that all the stimulus. Because for instance, if you look at me and you are with me and you start seeing, oh, okay, she talks like this and this and the other. So this is garbage that belongs to other people. Maybe it's no garbage, maybe it's something good, but that's sound that interferes in that relation in what I am giving you and the reaction that you have to me. Because if you are not fully present, you are not responding to my stimulus. You are responding to whatever is in your mind with all your stereotypes, with your, all your cultural baggage. We all have a lot of cultural baggage and maybe cultural from different cultures. We have raised like myself in Colombia versus here is different uh, culture. Next one, uh, next slide. And now it's very important uh, cultural mindfulness because as you can see all over the country, little by little, we have more diversity. And one of the things that we want to accomplish is diversity, is one of our goals. And diversity and to be inclusive and also to um, decrease inequalities. And it ha I have bias and stereotypes and that noise there when I'm not present doesn't allow me to really uh, look and uh, to have all those objectives that I want to do with the populations. Next slide. One of the main things that we need, and you have heard that uh, many times, um, that one of the uh, good reasons to pursue cultural mind mindfulness is to develop awareness of our own cultural biases. We all have cultural biases. If you say that you don't have it, that will be like a mystery for me because we have. We grow in families where certain bias were there and we hear them and we repeat them and we leave them. So it's very important for all of you to be aware of those cultural biases. And sometimes it's, um, it's uh, okay 
um, to have certain bias, but to discuss them because sometimes people get bias because some experience, traumatic experience. So you need to talk about that with somebody so you don't have to generalize and say, oh, is this person did this to me? Everybody that is similar to her or him is going to do that to me, okay? So questions so far? Okay, next slide. Uh, so the, the practicing cultural mindfulness, we need to be careful because for instance, the example of the concept of time uh, in some cultures, the concept of time is really observed when expected. For some people, for instance, for me, if you tell me, tell me the session is at three, I will be 10 minutes before. For some people will be three minutes late, five minutes or 10 minutes late. And for instance, in Japan, in one of the places where they really respect that time in the appointment. So there are people that prefer to be running in the time. And uh, for me, my personal opinion, that's stressful. If I am before, I am not running with, with stress. And so people sometimes make judgment about people that are early for an appointment. So could you write in the chat for some people, you, you can be the one that say, oh, she's always um, early because whatever or she's always late because whatever. Those kind of bias, because you haven't asked the person why she was always late or always right, or always uh, before or always late. So please write in the chat what you have here, or what do you think, why people uh, uh, arrive early or why people arrive late. Anxiety, yes, Patty, thank you. A lot of people say that that's the way to manage a, a anxiety because of anxiety. The same to me is anxiety. I like to protect my anxiety, yeah? Some people say that people come late because of what? I'm laughing because I don't want to tell you the group of people that usually come late. Uh, so I am running late because anxiety. You see how the same, not the same, how one person anxiety is handled this way and another person anxiety is handled a totally different way. Yeah, being late or being, uh, uh, or, or being early. Um, the stress, yeah. Um, ah, this is very interesting. Uh, Gail that says, sometimes being introvert or anxious makes you late. Why, why you are introvert? introvert? This is very interesting uh, because I immediately, I say, oh, maybe it's this. So Gail, can you say why the introverts could be, um, Come late? Uh, now, oddly enough, I've always taken, been known as an introvert. You may not uh, know, not, but um, sometimes I do not want to be noticed. So if there's a lot of people who already entered, people are focusing on them and I can slip in in the back and sit in the back and yes. be my quiet self. Yes. Yeah. I, when you put that, it's the first time that I say, oh, that's the reason. This is why they are quiet. They go to the, so nobody. Somebody put something that is so, and this is why time is a cultural issue. Brazil, exactly. In many Latin American countries says that the time is fluid. So I am from Colombia. The time is fluid for the majority of Colombian. 
and I am very on the before the time. Yeah, I, I like to have my time control. So people say that some people are late, especially people that want to be important to control. Yeah, to control the people that are going to attend. Yeah. Um, I'll, this is look, what Dana says, uh, uh, and that's totally, that's the comment of, of, of a lot of people, is that um, some people, um, when they have kids, they are late because uh, they don't know what is going to happen at the end of uh, when they are ready to go, what is going to happen, yeah? So there are things that are not predictable when you are um, dealing with kids. Uh, willing, yeah, because you are ready and you have to change the diaper or many other things. Um, yeah, not really wanting to interact with others, so I'll come late. Yeah, that, that are uh, times that is really a reason, a conflict meeting. So that's something that if um, if, if I have two meetings and the other run a little over the next one, is like, I don't have control over that. Um, yeah, very good. Is uh, Yeah, this is Tavi. Tavi, thank you. Uh, until then, but anyway. Okay, very interesting Tavi uh, point because the way that to handle the uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Thank you. Okay, very, very interesting all the, the points, but remember, is some cultures have certain tendencies but in those cultures, that individual ways of manage time for personal reasons, because they will train to do it that way, or because it's a choice that uh, that they have. Questions, comments. You have questions or comments. So, I have a question for you. Let's imagine that you are a, the executive director of an organization or the director of an organization, yeah? And uh, you have meetings scheduled like this one, for instance, from this time to this time, because if we don't have those times, is um, uh, how can we know? And if we come late, we don't know what they say at the beginning. And if we leave before, we don't know what happened at the end. So in general, people, when we have these meetings, people, most of the times they are uh, coming on time. Is, a, okay, first question. Do you think that people, are on time in virtual events more than in person to person? I, I want comments to this question. The question is, when we do things virtually, do you think that more people come on time that when do we do it, life or the way the, the other way around or more or less the same is the comparison on time between virtual and presential virtual virtual yes okay uh, yes this is very interesting really because the control issue there are people that are really punctual but if they take, I live in Miami, if they take I-95 to go to Broward, you don't know what is going to happen, yeah? Uh, somebody says that later during virtual, leave 
life more on time. This is interesting, the perceptions that people have. It's also very interesting how you perceive the, 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 other, the, the other person. Okay, so, Kaylin. Yeah, the traffic. Yeah, and you put your camera off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I used to say, I used to say, please cameras on everybody. And one day I say, oh my God, what about if somebody is so introvert that the 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 fact that see they're there makes them uncomfortable. So now a little more flexible, but in general, the other person, the other time somebody told me, no, Miriam, what I do is I put my face like a picture of me, but I don't show my face. Yeah. So I say, oh, this is, this is, uh, but it is nice to see people because when you are in a live supervision, in a live meeting, uh, is, is, um, you see each one. Okay. So. Sometimes we, we think that to be cultural mindfulness is easy. No, it takes a long training because you have to learn to shut down the sounds that you have in your brain. Because for instance, I'm, I'm going to interview you. Uh, you come, um, you are like 14 years old and I see you and I, I think, oh, she looks like 20. So immediately when she sits, I have a bias about her. That is not fair. Yeah. And that happened because we give opinions and we have bias all over because in the moment that she's walking and you feel that she's walking, you have to concentrate and breathe before and concentrate in that person that you don't know, but you know that her name is Candelaria because this is, this is in my book. So that's somebody called Candelaria. When she comes, you see her for the first time and you have to try to be fully present with her. If other thoughts come like, oh, she looks like my daughter thing. You have the thought, but you put it there. there. A little by little to start doing that, to be mindfulness. And nowadays it is a lot of trainings about mindfulness that you can have because they have, um, they have seen the, 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 the results that it, it brings. So sometime, a long time ago, we didn't, talk, we didn't talk about cultural mindfulness, but somebody told me, one of my participants, a patient, because at that time they were called patients in this uh, 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 center. She told me, Miriam, when you are with me, it's like we are in a bubble. Like it's like inner communion. She was Catholic, so she believes, believes in this communion. It was like a communion, only you and me. And I feel like I can tell or I can do whatever and it's okay. And I always had that in my mind, what she told me. Now, when I see cultural mindfulness, I always remind the hair and I say, I learn from her to be all on her. And cultural mindfulness is not only for your participant, it's for your partners, your friends, your kids. Yeah, kids get really disappointed when they say, mommy, today in the school, I have a fight. Oh, yes, yes, tell me. Uh, yes, 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 tell me. Okay, yes, 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 tell me. Yeah, they get really, really uncomfortable and anxious. So. Questions about mindfulness. Okay, one thing that is very important for the uh, family-run organizations, you are very lucky because the families share the culture 
families, this family run organization uh, has a family member that is part of you and they know the culture. So uh, it's, it's very, very advantage. It's, it's a lot of advantage because they can know a lot of the things that we are talking about, uh, how things are important and values. And you have more consideration for the culture because you are with family run organizations. So you get exposed to, let's see, imagine a Cuban husband, an Italian a partner, and the kids, teenagers living here. So you are exposed to all those cultures. So in that, in that way, your, your um, definition of culture is really, really a, more solid because the experience that you have. So uh, it was great when they told me that it was for family run organizations. Yeah, because I say you have an advantage over many, many other people. Questions, comments. So we are in the last slide, mindfulness. That's the slide number nine. Okay. So now, yeah. I am sorry to interrupt. I do. We do have a couple of questions. We'd love to hear thoughts from you, if I could. Yeah. One is when you were interviewing a potential staff member as an executive director or, or a family supervisor, how do you integrate cultural mindfulness into the conversation? Yeah. Yeah. Very important question. Yeah. So I will ask, how much how much do you know about culture yeah how much cultures are you um are you aware of that so I, I will i will sense like a little bit what is culture for that person and what is cultural mindfulness some people they don't know but i have to introduce yeah what happened when you have in front of you a person that you have difficulties understanding. How do you take out all those biases that you know? How do you know that person? So some people tell me, yes, I listen. What else do you have to, to do? Because to be fully present is all the senses, yeah? Plus your body, because you know that your body, also your energy, takes out energy and the person, the other person will uh, sense your energy. So that's that's a way of introducing the, the how they do it. Because as you can see it for the, the questions that you ask, only few people receive training in cultural mindfulness. So we cannot expect, they can talk about cultural competency. And that's the first part of culture. Remember that we they need to learn is the mindfulness, yeah? And the mindfulness is the concept of being fully present, being with the other, et cetera, et cetera. The, the three little things that we have at the beginning. So I will do something like that with somebody that I'm interviewing that I don't expect to have the concept of cultural mindfulness. We have notebooks here for our participants and the, this has been a series. So we have a notebook that people are able to take notes and I would love for a tool that they can include in their notebook. Can you give us maybe a tool or a strategy for outreach to families? I mean, when we're interviewing, what is what kind of question should we ask? Do you have any notes on that? Can we make a note? And yeah, one of the notes when you're interviewing is the, have are you around different cultures? Yeah. Is that very important? Do you live in the neighborhood that have different cultures? Do you have in your family people from different cultures? Do you go to a school where do you have different cultures? Because how much exposed this person have? And what have you learned from those cultures? Yeah, because they can tell you, I have, I have learned that they are so different that even I have, I have 
we were in the program, in one of the program, five Colombians, and we were so different, each one to the, to the other person. So it will be like a tool of uh, what cultures do you know? What made you understand, if they say, I was able to understand this culture, what made you to take it from their own experience, what they have learned? Yeah, because you have all the time to teach, but it's also important to see what strength they have dealing with culture. Because some people have strengths dealing with culture, yeah? Like if you are a teacher and now you want to be a clinician. So what will you, how do you handle kids from different culture? How do you handle fights among kids with different cultures? All those kind of things. Or what do you do when you go to the supermarket and the person is from different culture and you don't understand what she is saying? What will you do to do that? So there are practical questions that allow you to see how if she says, oh, I will be so mad that I will leave the store because her English is uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's telling you a lot of things. Yeah. Oh, I love the question that you just said. This is, I will use it from now on. I'm going to steal it. But when mm. interviewing, to ask what cultures have you been around besides your own even? Yeah, so yeah. what's your community? I love that question. I'm going to make yeah. sure I... Yeah, yeah, you can take it. Yeah, yes. Thank uh, you. And sometimes I say no, because all, all of us are Hispanic from Cuba. Okay, yeah. Okay, do you have a Cuban... Doctors as friends? Yes. Do you have uh, hairdressers as doctors? Oh, yes. Do you have, so, okay. Students in the PhD program. So you help her to see that education creates different cultures. Yeah? That's fabulous. We have one last question before I'm gonna yeah. ask everybody to put themselves off mute and ask your own questions. But one last one. Can you talk about strategies for outreach to families to increase your organization's cultural mindfulness? What can we do as an organization really to reach out to different places in the community to really increase our staff and our organization? Yeah, there are uh, at two levels. I'm going to give you one general uh, level is to have like a fair when you show different cultures. So they go and they see, oh, there is the flag of Brazil, the flag of this, the flag of this. So they will see, uh, I can relate to that. And you have a staff great and if you have music from different cultures that will be great that's like an a, like a general thing my recommendation let's imagine that you are in an organization that wants to uh, do outreach in the haitian community you need to have a worker that is haitian and helps you in that outreach because if you look like me, they will say, oh my God, this is, that it, she speaks different, but maybe she can be an American, yeah? That's that's what people will tell, yeah, what thing. So you, you, you really have to try to mirror the population and uh, focus. And this is very important for the, the executive directors. You have- Fabulous. Yeah, and this is for the board of directors and for everybody. You need to mirror your population of focus. Let's imagine you need to know your demographic of the neighborhood where you are. And if you have Haitians and Black Americans, and that's it, the majority. So you need to do something with your board of directors and your staff, yeah? And you need to mirror the population of focus. That's one of the things to be cultural competent and is one of the class standards that SAMHSA recommend to mirror the population of focus, yeah? Oh, thank you, that was wonderful. Kimberly says, being relevant with your surroundings. I would love to ask everybody to take yourself off mute and put your cameras on if you feel comfortable and just ask a question. Does anyone have any questions? Fran, do you have a question? 
Nope, I thought I saw you raising your hand. Kimberly, can you talk? I couldn't hear. I asked Kim if yeah. she would be comfortable. This is Patty and I did have a question. Okay, Patty. Um, hi, Miriam, it's been lovely listening to you speak. And I'm wondering what you would recommend for those staff who are already on board who need uh, better exposure to not only cultural competence, but cultural humility. Yes, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of that, a lot. And, and I have to be honest with you because you are family run organizations. And sometimes people hide the bias and the stereotyping to get the job. Yeah. So this mm. is why you need to expose them and to really um, sense in them constantly and have a, a policy about of cultural diversity that uh, that um, they can discuss things and people feel safe when somebody tells them something like offensive related with the race, ethnicity, gender orientation, et cetera, et cetera, because it happens. It really, really happens. So training and training and experiential training. The Jess Institute has excellent training related to gender orientation, gender that really facilitate that piece. And there are organizations that do have because Sometimes I um, talk informally with the staff from the agencies, not now, but I used to do and uh, in different positions, the comments about certain races, certain genders, certain things, they were really, really that you say, oh my God, are we in 1820? Something really, really bad. So you have to be training and training and training and feeling and making them something. The more diversity you have in your organization, the better, because they will get friends little by little. They could get friends that are different from them and they will say, oh, they are not that bad. Yeah. And thank you. Latonya, you have your question? afternoon i'm definitely enjoying the conversation and the sharing i really appreciate it um and the way you're sharing about the diversity um which can be very challenging especially i'm in washington state in northwest and uh being able to uh there are some of the comments about mirroring your population that has definitely been a challenge one of the yeah. things that I'm also hearing you share is the importance of that education and the awareness. I also feel it's important to help support our families to know that they are the experts on who they are and um, not to feel that it's not okay to share about who you are and what you what you bring as a culture to. Uh, your family, sometimes we feel like we're the ones that are educating, but we are the ones that need to educate and help them feel um, it, that's a positive thing to be able to educate and support uh, mm -hmm. folks mm -hmm. that are working with them because the more knowledge is the power to be able to support them about what, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. their, their needs are. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Thank and, you. and I, I, I work in, in, in Seattle and around there, and it's very interesting because I know how it looks, the board of directors there, how it looks, and in many, many places that I go, yeah? So it's very important, for instance, to have, when you have diverse staff, to have poll logs, and they talk about the food. And in that family setting, people are more tuned to to take what you have to offer in your culture. Yeah, so that helps a lot, yeah. We have one last time for one more question and yeah. it's from Kimberly. Kimberly, if you'd like to ask your question. Um, well, it's not really a question, it's more of an observation. Um, we've been a foster adoptive family um, throughout the United States and we are currently raising our 28th child. And one of the questions that we do, or not really a question, but 
a lot of the children that come into our our home and into our life have a different lifestyle. Some mm-hmm. of them are from a different region of the country. And so how they were brought up is a little bit different. So we have open-ended questions like, oh, how did you have dinner? Or what is acceptable in your home? Just to be more open and relevant to where they're coming from. So Mm -hmm, it's not mm -hmm. so foreign to them. Mm -hmm. And then also when we lived overseas, joining in with the culture that was overseas, we had our children attending. We used to live in Japan. So our children were fortunate enough to go to a Japanese school and learn their culture and bring it back to America. And it was just something that I ingrained with our children as well as our adopted children to accept people where they are and learn and don't be afraid of asking questions because that's how we educate ourselves to learn. And I, even one of my children who now lives in a different county, I started speaking her terminology, like her lingo, if you would. And she's like, mom, I never thought you would talk like that. And I said, I'm trying to be relevant. Is that not relevant? She's like, no, you're being hip. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, all right. So I'm I'm trying to fit in. So those are great points, Kimberly. Um, I'm sorry, we're almost yeah. out of time and I need to turn the conversation over to Dana to do our housekeeping. And thank you, Kimberly, for speaking on that. And thank you again, Miriam. Dana? Oh, Yes, thank you so much. Um, You will be getting the slides, a recording, and a workbook with some action steps. So between now and next month, we ask that you reflect on your organization's mission, programming, and practices, and think about whether or not those are culturally mindful, and identify some changes that you can make to foster cultural mindfulness. And finally, meet your with your mentor or a mentee. We want to invite you to join us next month on, um, oops, that shouldn't say March 14th, that should say April 11th um, at 3 p.m. We're going to be talking with Dr. Sandy Addis, the chairman of the National Dropout Prevention Center, about trauma-skilled practices for family-run organizations. Um, we also have a survey that we're doing. It's geared towards clinicians and clinicians in training to help us learn about what different states are doing to train clinicians in family engagement. So if you are a clinician, Gina has just put the link to that survey in the chat. Um, Please take that brief three to five minute survey for us. If you're not, but you know any clinicians or clinicians in training, please, please share that with them. Um, finally, we invite you to reach out to us with any questions at all. You'll get these con- this contact information in the slides. And the last little thing, when you close the Zoom meeting, our feedback survey will pop up. It's a very brief survey that we're, SAMHSA requires us to complete so that we can bring you more trainings like these. Um, please pull out your phone to scan that QR code or just close the meeting and that survey will pop up. We really appreciate you taking that. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you again next month and we'll be closing the Zoom meeting and Miriam, we'll see you on a feedback okay. um, in about 15 minutes. Okay, Thank you for bye-bye. Being with us. bye-bye, bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you everyone. Just, just to jump in really quickly, I know there's a couple of people here from New Mexico. We would love you to share that survey or fill it out yourself. We have almost every state, but we're missing New Mexico and Nebraska and South Carolina. So if you know of anyone in those areas, please share. And North Dakota as well. And North South Dakota. Dakota. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. We'll shut the computer off or the Zoom off in about three minutes. That way you'll have some time to um, leave the event and go into the survey.
We will be closing the Zoom in exactly two minutes. We will be ending this session in less than one minute.